So we have one, I think one last slide in chapter 45 to finish up with community ecology. So that will not take us long. And it's actually uh, coming first full circle, because if you remember this first slide when we introduced chapter 45, I said we'll get back to talking about Asian carp later. And uh, now's the time. So that's our last topic is looking at invasive species. So the last few things we talked about last week, we were looking at biodiversity and measures of biodiversity. We talked about species richness and relative abundance. I told you we'll do some calculations on that later. Um, we'll still get to that probably Wednesday. And then we looked at uh, foundation species versus keystone species. We watched our video about wolves and Yellowstone. Um, and that's where we ended our discussion. And I said we pick up with invasive species. So here we are. Um, you guys have heard of invasive species before, I'm sure. So tell me what you know about invasive species. What makes a species invasive? Say that again. It survives through all four seasons. It survives through all four seasons. So in an area that's seasonal, that would probably be a characteristic, right? So what about, what makes, if you can survive through all four seasons, what does that sort of uh, attribute to your ability to thrive? What does that mean for you as a species? But I, I guess what I'm saying is take it a little bit broader. So that's one they, specific characteristic, but what else makes you invasive? They can outcompete. Say that again? They can outcompete the, um, species that are already there. Yeah, they're out competing native species, right? So if they're if they're out competing native species, what does that mean about their native range? Are they in their native range or are they outside of it? Yeah, outside. So the first thing you see up here is that they're non-native or exotic. So an exotic species is, is, is another term for a non-native species. That means that it is introduced, right? It exists, it's living in a habitat that it didn't evolve in. So it's outside of um, its own range, which means it's outside of its native community. So it's released from competition from its natural competitors. It's released from predation pressure by its natural predators, right? So the things that sort of keep that um, community structure balanced, things like keystone species and foundation species and those species interactions can be totally out of whack for the invasive species itself because it's not interacting with those same other um, species that would sort of keep that balance. So, free from competition, free from predation, oftentimes it is uh, able to reproduce out of control and then uh, outcompete the native species that existed there before it got there. Now, how do these things get where they get? Mostly humans, yes. Purposefully or accidentally? What do you guys think? Both, yeah, for sure. So give me an example of a purposeful introduction of a non-native species. Think of anything? It doesn't have to be a specific species, it can, but just an example of like an instance or a set of circumstances. Can you think of anything? Yeah. Someone releasing goldfish. Releasing, yeah, he said goldfish, but it could be any fish, right? Or any aquatic species. So maybe you've got something as a pet and you're done being a pet owner. And so you just decide, I'm going to let it go, be free, right? Go home. Well, it's not good to go home if it came from like, Asia, <laughs> right? So if it's a species that's been imported to the pet trade and then it gets released, uh, that's a good way, right, to introduce something into a non-native range. I was trying to remember, there is a lizard or a snake in Florida that is out of control. You guys know what I'm talking about? I, I forgot to look it up. Say it. Is it, is it boa constrictors? I think it might be. In like the Everglades, or they're just like taking over because there were a bunch of them. Shane, are you looking it up? Yeah. Do, yeah, go for it, reptile girl. I think it might, I think you might be right. Yeah, and so they're becoming a big problem, right? And so then you have to figure out how to control that invasive species. Um, what about plants? Can plants be invasive? Yeah, kudzu, right? English ivy is a big one now. Um, privet. Uh, what about the pear tree? You guys ever notice in the spring when the pear trees first come out, they're like the first ones to bloom. They're white. They smell like fish. You know what I'm talking about? So a lot, of, they're actually um, feral versions of uh, Bradford pears. So I don't know if anybody does in the landscape here knows what a Bradford pear tree is, but they're very pretty. Um, they're an Asian species. They do really well. 
Um, species do really well that are from China and Japan and other Asian countries here because latitude is similar and so the climate is fairly similar. And um, so the plants that are well adapted to grow in that area of the world also usually do pretty well here, but then you take away their natural community, right? So they have a tendency to be really competitive. So something like kudzu, what does kudzu do? Why does it, why is it so invasive? Do you guys know how, what is kudzu and how does it grow? What's its growth habit? Survive. Yeah, survive. So it go, it kind of climbs over everything. Luckily, it doesn't do great in shade. So it does really well in areas of full sun. So you see it in places where you have like um, moved earth, right? Disturbance is really good for kudzu. It doesn't creep into forests because it doesn't do well in shade. So it kind of stops at the edge of the undeveloped habitat, which is good um, because otherwise it can choke stuff out, right? It, it outcompetes and, and outgrows the native stuff. But something like privet, which was brought in as a landscape plant, um, it escapes cultivation really easily because it makes berries and birds eat berries and then they fly away and poop berries, berry seeds, seeds right inside that are inside the berry. So privet does just fine in the shade. So very frequently you'll find um, natural forests that are sort of being overtaken by privet. So that's, a, that's what we're looking at. Lots of examples of um, invasive species. We could do a whole semester top special topics course on invasive species. That sounds like a fun class, don't you think? Maybe I should propose that. Um, anyway, what we're, the problem that we're looking at here is that they are capable of altering the ecosystem dramatically. Okay, so when you're talking about uh, relative abundance, when you are talking about how many out of the total number of organisms in a community, how many of those organisms are made up by one particular species, when you when you're talking about something that's invasive, it starts to become uh, gets to the point where its relative abundance is high in the community because there are so many and they're reproducing quickly and they're outcompeting native species. So they're altering structure, which is why it can be problematic. Um, Asian carp are a really good example of this. They have um, invaded most of the rivers in the United States. And the real problem is that they're getting into the Great Lakes and threatening fisheries. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail because I'm going to let you guys look at this video um, that was put out by the Tennessee Aquarium about Asian carp as one of your um, Easter eggs for bonus questions on the final. So take a look at that if you get a chance. And then there is um, a map that sort of shows you what happened when they connected some of the river systems to the Great Lakes. So I'm going to leave that for you guys to investigate in the interest of time and also um, potential bonus questions. Okay, so look into Asian carp as your invasive species bonus topic. Questions about community ecology before we look into ecosystems? That's good. Questions from Zoom land? Everybody good? All right. All right, so I want to try to get through ecosystems as much as we can today so that we can talk about the last chapter on biodiversity and conservation on Wednesday, because Wednesday will be the last day that I lecture. So Monday, remember, is going to be our um, optional discussion. So I'll play a, a documentary for you guys. We might actually meet in the ballroom instead of in here just because that film might go a few minutes over and I don't want to be rushed. Um, but I'll let you guys know the details on that. So today and Wednesday is, is it, that's as far as we're going to get. So let's see where we um, how we can how much of this we can work through before we call it quits for the semester. Again, a lot of what we're talking about in these ecology chapters is overlap because they are all so closely interrelated with one another that you get the same sort of terms and topics. What we're going to mostly focus on in the ecosystems chapter is um, energy and nutrient flow. Because remember, when we talk about populations, we're talking about one what? A population is made up of individuals of one species. Yeah, all the same species. Then we go up to the community level, and we're talking about interactions between multiple populations, right? So different species. Then when we start talking about ecosystem ecology, what are we adding into the mix at this point? What's the difference between community and ecosystem? Yeah, you're adding in environmental factors, the non-living stuff or abiotic components of the ecosystem. Um, things like weather, things like energy, things like nutrients, right? Things that aren't necessarily organic or living, but that are uh, impactful on the living organisms in the ecosystem. So that's what we're talking about here. 
The intro to this chapter talks about a virus called sin nombre, which means the virus without a name or without a name. Um, there was an epidemic of this virus. It's a respiratory disease. Um, it was really hard on young people, like young adults who were otherwise healthy. Um, and what, it, what the thing that was really interesting about it was that they couldn't, first of all, explain why there was this rapid rise in this sort of mysterious illness. Um, but it happened during uh, the season where, you guys ever heard of El Nino? Anybody? Some of you guys are the weather, yeah? So El Nino is this weather pattern that causes a lot of rain. Um, so what happened with this particular story is that the increase in waterfall out in the desert southwest, where it's usually fairly dry, leads to an increase in pinion pines, which produce pinion nuts. They kind of look like, um, you guys know what pine nuts look like? They're real similar to pinion pines. Maybe those little, they look like this, like pine nuts you buy at the grocery store, um, which feed deer mice. Okay, so deer mice get an increase in food. So they increase in reproduction. And it turns out that they carry the virus. Okay, and then they get into people's houses. And when they leave uh, droppings behind, and you come in and you sweep up those droppings, it becomes uh, airborne, and then you inhale these particles, and then you get synonymous. Okay, so the tie-in here is the weather. They've got multiple organisms carrying, you know, transmitting diseases, acting as vectors, which we talked about before with um, West Nile, or not West Nile, that's mosquitoes, but with Lyme disease, but the ticks. Early on, we started introducing that. But in this case, it's also because of the weather, so the changes in the weather pattern. So, just another story of that interconnectedness. And in this case, it had to do with excess rainfall in a place that doesn't normally get so much rainfall. So just another example. We've talked about fire. We talked about the oak pine barren habitats and the carter blue butterflies and the wild woodland. So this is just a reminder that that was another example of ecosystem level ecology where you bring in the non-living components. In this case, uh, birds, right? Periodic burning. Um, that clears out the ecosystem. And the living things depend on that cycle to release nutrients back into the soil and also to reset um, sort of the population boundary for the tall trees that will out compete and shade out the lupin and then eventually kick out the, the butterflies. So that's just sort of a, re a review of what we talked about in that first chapter of what ecosystem ecology actually is. And the first sort of new topic that we get to in this chapter is food chains and food webs. So this is where we start talking about energy. So is energy living or is energy non-living? Non-living, right? So there are a couple of things that we need to remember as we think about energy. Um, do you make new energy or destroy energy or is it all the same energy? It's all the same energy, right? Those are some of the laws of thermodynamics. You can't create or destroy it, but they're always transfer reactions that are going on um, as, as energy moves from one place to another. So food chain traces that energy, okay, through an ecosystem. Um, food chain is linear, meaning it starts with one organism and moves up to the next level and then up sort of like a ladder, right, or a chain, hence the name food chain. We're going to look at this single path through the chain so that you guys can get a good look at these um, terms for the levels. So we're going to call these trophic levels. When you think of the word trophic, Think about words that you know that already use that root, like autotroph or heterotroph. What is an autotroph? Yeah, makes its own food, self feeder. So, what's a heterotroph? These others, yes, other feeder, right? So, trophic refers to feeding or energy. So, a trophic level is basically an energy level. Um, producers are our autotrophs, they're going to be the photosynthetic organisms at the base of the food chain. Where are they getting their energy? From? From the environment, specifically the sun, right? So they're harvesting sunlight energy. That is where energy is entering the ecosystem. In just about every ecosystem that we talk about on the earth, the ultimate source of the energy is the sun, okay? There are ecosystems like hydrothermal vent community ecosystems that have chemical energy as their base. Okay, but largely for our purposes, we're going to be thinking about photosynthesis and not chemosynthesis so much. Okay, but just keep in mind that that's a thing and it, and it is part of the big story. Okay, we're, using, we're going to talk about photosynthesis mostly. So we've got producers at the bottom of the food chain. The next trophic level up are your primary consumers. 
A primary means what? Hmm? It is, but what does the word primary mean? First. first. Yeah, so you've got your first level of consumer. It's herbivores, and herbivores eat what? Plants or photosynthetic organisms. So in our food chain, it's pictured here. We've got green algae as our producer at the base. So we're talking about a, a protist, right, or a single cell eukaryote, or a sometimes an algae, you've got multicellular, colonial, or whatever. But you've got photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms at the base, and then you've got primary uh, consumers in the in the form of mollusks, okay? the little snails eating the algae. So that's your primary consumer. Next up, you've got secondary consumers. What does secondary mean? Second, right? So the next consumer in the line, carnivores that eat primary consumers. So in our chain here, you've got your skull. Okay, so a small fish that's eating those mollusks and the mollusks eating the algae, and you're just moving up the chain. Okay. Tertiary consumers. What's tertiary? Third, right. So this is following a clear pattern, yes. So these are going to be carnivores that eat other carnivores. Like our Chinook salmon at the top of the food chain here is eating the sculpin, and the sculpin is eating the mollusk, and the mollusk is eating the algae, and there you go. There's your food chain. Um, in this food chain, the Chinook salmon is the tertiary consumer, but he is also the apex consumer or apex predator. So that term, those terms are all interchangeable. The apex is what? It's the top. Yep, it's the tip. Apex really means tip. So an apex can face down, just, just, just to be confusing, like in your heart. I'm not going to get into that, but the apex means the tip, okay? In this case, it does mean the tip top, right? So the apex com uh, consumer or the apex predator is at the top of the food chain. So can you be apex and tertiary? Can you be classified as both? Sorry? You can, yeah. In like this circumstance, that's right, where the third person in line, the third person, the third organism in line here, the third consumer is the top. So what my point is is that you can keep going. You can have quaternary consumers. You can have, I don't know what the word for fifth, fifth level is, but you get my point, right? So the apex just means top of the food chain. So the lion or the wolf in Yellowstone, right? Or the salmon in this community. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't always have to be primary, secondary, tertiary. Could you be a secondary consumer and an apex predator? You're saying yes. In what instance? Uh, it doesn't have to be specific species. Just like you know, this guy isn't there, right? If there is no salmon in this food chain, then your sulfur is your apex predator. You get what I'm saying? So these are relative terms, okay? The really important thing to think about is energy flow. And that's what we're really looking at here. So energy is lost at each trophic level. We're gonna take a look at that in a couple of slides. But basically the algae as the producer is harnessing energy from the sun. It's using some of that energy for its own metabolic processes. And the rest of it, it's making tissues with, right? It's using it for building reactions, anabolic reactions that require energy. And that tissue that that algae built has got that stored energy, right? Remember net primary productivity? Yeah, the leftovers that this guy didn't use for metabolism are being used as food for the next food chain, the next um, organism in the food chain. This makes sense? So all of the energy that the green algae as the producer takes in from the sun isn't available to the monks as the primary consumer, right? The only energy that's left over is the net energy after the meta metabolic energy that the green algae itself has the green algae has used for itself does that make sense i i can't tell if i'm saying it's saying things clearly or not all right more on that in just a second but food chains may be overly simplistic models of ecosystem interactions why do i say that why might this be overly simplistic Yeah, there may be other species involved, right? It's kind of like I keep saying, no species exist in a vacuum. Nothing really follows this exact food chain pattern. So what do you think is more realistic? How about a web, right? So that's where we get into food webs. Food webs are interconnected models of trophic relationships within an ecosystem. 
uh, taking a look at this, a little more complex, <laughs> right, than your chain. See? Web, chain, web, right? Um, when you start looking at these interactions, this is nice because it's color coded. You can sort of see who is eating who, kind of trace the flow of energy, but you get stuff like this, or you've got this green arrow that goes up here to this opossum shrimp. So that means he's eating somebody down here. So this shrimp is an omnivore. Ah, huh. well, when we define primary consumers and secondary consumers and so on, we didn't really account for that. But there are organisms that eat both, right? Whatever they want. So Food webs take those sort of things into account. What about this? What's going on here with the slimy sculpin? It's got an arrow. So these guys at the top, these in purple, are probably apex, right? And they're all feeding on these blue guys. But what's going on here? What is this arrow from the slimy sculpin over to the rainbow smelt and the yellow perch? What does that mean? Yeah, they're eating each other in the same sort of level. So they can eat the things, the primary consumers below them in the food web, or the, 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 the let's say the lower trophic level, but they can also eat things in their own trophic level because they're it's complicated and interconnected. So that's the idea. What about this weirdo over here that has this purple arrow that's going all the way across from everyone? That is a sea lamprey. Do you guys remember what lampreys do? The little mouth parts here can give you a little bit of a hint if you don't remember. Yeah, they're ectoparasites, right? So they can feed off of anybody because they latch onto the outside and they use that weird rasping tongue to make a hole in the flesh and just feed off of their, their host on the outside. So you get the idea of how interconnected and complicated food webs are compared to food chains, but much more accurate model representation of natural community, right? So it's more complicated to follow the flow of energy through a food web, absolutely, than it is to follow it through a chain. Um, I'm not going to ask you to analyze any food webs and tell me anything about energy flow necessarily. The only thing I'm going to expect you to know is that this is a more complicated model and why. Um, and I also will expect you to be able to tell me who is in what trophic level if I were to give you a case study. Okay, same as the other types of questions that I talked about before. I would give you an explanation of a relationship and then you tell me who is it. Okay, that would be the types of questions that you'll see about food webs, food chains, trophic levels. Um, again, just a visualization of two chains a, a terrestrial food chain, a marine food chain, and then a web, just to illustrate once again the difference between the two. Um, both are useful. If you're going to do calculations of energy flow, it is easier to do it in a chain okay, than it is in a web. So that's what we're going to do next. And you'll also be expected to tell me uh, these numbers, okay? but nothing complicated. We're going to work in tens, okay? so you don't need to calculate or anything crazy. But I do want you to be able to calculate uh, energy availability at different trophic levels. So we're talking about trophic efficiency. And I always like to say, it sort of seems more, more um, accurate to call it trophic inefficiency because you lose so much energy from one level to the next. In fact, about 90% of energy is lost with each trophic level you jump. Okay, so efficiency is actually low for trophic inefficiency, right? Energy transfer reactions by nature are inefficient. You lose some of that energy oftentimes as heat, right? Um, but in this case, what we're really talking about is how much energy is used, lost, and put, and then put into tissues, which is then available to the next level. So overall, biomass increase, biomass decreases at each level. Okay, bear with me on this, because less energy is available to build new body tissues. What am I talking about? Overall biomass, so that's what we're sort of looking at here in this growth experiment. If you look at primary producers, there are a ton of them, okay? This is also measuring energy, but right now we're just gonna use it to look at biomass. That means like, if you look out the window, what is the predominant color that you see? Hmm? Green, right? Does that mean that the, grass, the blades of grass individually are larger than something like a human or a hawk or something that would be higher up in the trophic level? It doesn't, it just means that there are more of them, right? But if you took all of the green stuff 
and you piled it up and you weighed it, it would outweigh us by a lot, right? That's the idea. But there's more um, overall biomass at the lower trophic levels than there are at the higher trophic levels. Even though we might be bigger, there are fewer of us. You guys follow? Okay, so why? Well, if you are taking in a million joules of sunlight, if you take all of the photosynthetic organisms out there, all the green stuff, they're taking in a million joules of sunlight. They're using 90% of that for anabolism, for ATP synthesis, for breaking down the glucose that they're putting together, right? Metabolism in general. So you end up with about 10,000 joules of energy captive in that trophic level. That is what is available to the crickets, the grasshopper, whatever that guy is, on the next level, the primary consumer. So this is the net primary productivity at this trophic level. Is that connection coming together for you guys? Okay, so you're losing a ton of energy from all of the sunlight that's hitting the earth. Also, all of the sunlight energy that's hitting the earth isn't necessarily being used, right? Some of it's being reflected back out into space. Some of it's getting absorbed into the pavement and become heat. Like it's not all going straight into primary producer. So that's kind of the idea. Then you have your primary producers, about 10% of the energy in this entire level is actually going to get transferred up to the next level, which means that there's less energy, 90% less energy for these grasshoppers to use to build their own body tissue. So there are fewer grasshoppers than there are flowering plants. So biomass is decreasing because energy availability is decreasing. Because each time you jump up, you're still taking the net. And at each level, the net decreases because each level is using much of the energy that it intakes in meta metabolic processes, including building body tissue. And those body tissues are what the next trophic level in mind feeds on. Make sense? So, what you will see, what you'll be expected to do, is if I ask you, I may ask you for a percentage of energy that is available at a particular level. So if I tell you, I might ask you how much energy is available to secondary consumers if there are 10,000 joules in the primary producers. So just be able to jump up and down the, the trophic levels with percent. So if you've got 10% of the energy of total sunlight energy, let's, let's actually leave the sunlight out of it. Right, so let's, let's say this one. If you've got 10% of the energy produced by the primary producers that's available to the consumer, that's 10%. What if you compare secondary to primary? What's the percentage? 1%, right? And then what? 0.1%, right? So that's what I'm talking about. Just have a, a working knowledge of that, the way that energy transfer gets smaller and smaller as you go up the trophic pyramid until eventually you get to the top. There's not that much energy stored in that trophic level because there are fewer apex predators. Even though they might be bigger, that a hawk is a heck of a lot bigger than a mouse, which is a heck of a lot bigger than a grasshopper. But there are fewer of them overall because biomass decreases as you go up because there's less energy available to build body tissues, which includes reproduction. Right? And then ecology fun, it's all tied together. All the things we talk about all relate back to one another at some point. All right. That is pretty much it for our energy discussion. Energy enters an ecosystem. How? Where does it come from? The sun. I was talking about hydrothermal vents, in which case, hmm? chemosynthesis, yeah, which is, I'm not going to throw confusing things at you. So I'm mostly asking you to tell me that it comes from the sun. And then energy leaves the system. How? How does it leave? Where does it go? That's a good question. Energy transfer reactions are inefficient, right? The energy that you intake, some of it you're going to use to, to make ATP, which you're ultimately going to use. But what's your metabolic byproduct that you're that you're making that's uh, not it's energy, but it's not energy that can do work? Heat. Yeah. So most of the time, when you're talking about energy flow through a system, I don't even know if I have a good a good picture that really gets to it. Not so much. When you're talking about energy flow, it's coming into a system as sunlight energy, it's leaving as heat energy, but it's never created or destroyed. It's just changing forms, okay? 
that's what we really want to talk about is that flow of energy through the system. Um, so it enters and it exits. That's a little bit different than when we start talking about cycling of nutrients. So nutrients don't really, they don't necessarily enter and exit in a form like we talk about with sunlight energy or heat with energy. These are cycling through. Okay, so when we talk about biogeochemical cycles, we're talking about the, the marriage of biology, chemistry, and geology as you take elements like carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and so on, and you change them from one form to another, organic to inorganic, um, rocks to body tissues, right? And all the other ways that you can sort of cycle nutrients through the system. So they don't flow through like energy, but matter is recycled, okay? When your body tissues, when an animal's body tissues decompose, where do those um, elements go? Into the soil, into the water, right? Which is ultimately gonna be picked up by something else along the way. Maybe it's incorporated into rocks, right? If it's, if it's subjected to pressure or particular types of environmental circumstances, or maybe rocks break down because water's flowing over them and the organisms that live in the water are picking up things like calcium out of the water and then making, I don't know, an exoskeleton, right? So you see how it all sort of just cycles through and become, takes on different forms, taking on a variety of chemical forms may exist in the atmosphere, on land, in water, or beneath Earth's surface. So the, let's think about something like carbon. So this is your list of your six most common elements in living things. Carbon's number one, right? We're carbon-based life forms. So the carbon that is integrated into plant leaves, where does it come from? CO2, which is where? Atmosphere, in the air, or in the water. So we're talking about terrestrial plants that are coming, just coming out of the atmosphere. So you've got carbon in the atmosphere that is then sequestered through carbon fixation and photosynthesis into the leaves of the plant, right? And then um, let's say I eat a salad. Where is the carbon in those lettuce leaves going? Going into my nutrient pool, right? I'm gonna eat it and my body's gonna digest it and absorb those nutrients. And those carbon molecules are now available for me to do with what I need to do with them. What am I gonna do with them? Whatever my cells need, right? If I need to make proteins to build body tissues, that's what's gonna happen. Those carbons are gonna get incorporated into that. And then let's say the end of my useful life has come and I am buried in a mushroom burial suit. You guys heard about the mushroom burial suit? <laughs> yeah. Did you see it on YouTube or something? No. Just happened to know, but hear about weird stuff. Yeah, so basically it's one form of a natural burial. So instead of going to a, um, what are the people called? What's the name for like a uh, undertaker? <laughs> Not to call it an undertaker, like the, the funeral home, right? If you go there and they uh, prepare you for a like traditional burial in our culture, they pump you full of preservatives and put you in a box and bury you in the ground, right? So that's not really nutrient cycling. It is, but it takes a long time. So let's say mushroom burial suit, or let's just say natural burial, no preservatives, just go into a hole in the ground, then you decompose. Where does the carbon go? As you mentioned, into the soil, right? Into the water supply, and then back into the cycle again. So the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere has been in the air, in the trees, in my body, in the ground, and back again. Okay, so that's basically the biogeochemical cycle. And everything, all the elements, whether they're big, uh, major elements like the ones on this list, or even trace elements, it all does the same thing. And it's cycling through these ecosystems. Um, and that's the big, big picture of biogeochemical cycling. Um, so we're going to talk about water, and we're going to talk about carbon, and I think that'll be the only two that we'll have time to really discuss. So um, let's talk about water first. Why do we study the water cycle when we start looking at ecosystem ecology? Because that's where we are, right? Ecosystem ecology. Is water living or non-living? It's non-living, right? Just H2O. But why is it important for living systems? Yeah, everything needs it, right? It's foundational. Like, a huge percentage of your body is made up of water, whether it's inside your cells or in your blood or in your tissue fluid, it's pure, mostly water, like 60 to 70%, okay? That's a lot by mass, right? Um, why is it so important? Well, we all need it for chemical reactions, right? We need it for a solvent in which chemical reactions can take place. 
Um, do you guys remember dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis? Well, not hydrolysis, yes. Hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis, breaking things and building things, always with water uh, in organic molecules. So it's super important. Um, when you start talking about ecosystem ecology, you have to think about where your water is coming from and how it's being used and, and cycled. Here's an interesting uh, figure. 2.5% 2 2 approximately of water on Earth is fresh. What is the other 97.5? Salt water. How helpful is that to living things? Yeah, it depends. If you're a marine species, you're well adapted to salt water. But if you're not, then, then you can't drink it, right? If you run out of clean water at your house, you can't go drink salt water. You will eventually die. Right? It'll cause imbalances homeostatically and you'll dehydrate and that's it for you. Um, so fresh water is important, but it's a very small percentage of our overall water supply. And less than 1% of that fresh water is easily accessible to living things. So where's the rest of it? Underground. Where else? Maybe water vapor. Yeah, where else might you find water trapped? Frozen, yep, permafrost, ice, things like that, right? Ice caps. Um, so it's not easy to get fresh water. We have it developed technologies to increase water availability. What do we do? This is one of those examples of humans increasing our carrying capacity. How do we increase our available water, uh, fresh water? Desalination treatment plants, right? Taking the salt out. Uh, what about digging? What we're digging into wells, digging wells into aquifers. Um, water treatment plants of all kinds, not just desalination, but just cleaning the water that we use on, on the daily. So lots of ways to sort of increase that for us. But fresh water is still a commodity. There are places in the world where your whole day is spent just walking to the nearest place to get fresh water and gather a bucket to bring back home, right? So fresh water is something that you have to think about. Um, we take it for granted because we turn on the sink and there's water, but it's not that way for everyone. And the more um, people, the more the human population grows, the more of a challenge that becomes, and also climate right, threatens the things like fresh water. So important to think about there. All right, you guys, here are some terms. About half of these you already know and you've known since like fourth grade, and the other half might be new. Okay, but I'm going to ask you guys to use these terms on your exam to tell me about the water cycle. Um, when you look at what happens with water, it's the same water that's been here forever, right? Since the earth formed, um, and it just cycles through. Here's how it goes. Let's start with evaporation and sublimation. Evaporation is one of the ones you guys learned in elementary school. What does that mean? Yeah, turning water into water vapor, right? So water from the ocean, water from the lakes gets heated to the point where it turns into vapor and it goes into the atmosphere. Um, sublimation is probably not when they teach you in fourth grade when you first learn about rain and, and uh, snowfall. Sublimation means uh, solid straight to gas. So you skip the liquid phase. So it's when ice it goes straight to water vapor. That's sublimation. Okay? So that's why it's classified with evaporation. Basically water, uh, okay? Both of those. And then what's condensation? This is one of the fourth grade ones. But I don't know fourth grade was a while ago, so what's condensation? What does it mean when water vapor condenses? Yeah. Gas to liquid. Yep, it cools and they get closer to each other and they slow down in movement and they become liquid once again. Okay, so condensation is how you get clouds to form. And then what's precipitation? Rain, yeah, or snow, or hail, or sleet, anytime it falls back down. Okay, so evaporation, condensation, precipitation, those are the ones they teach in Okay, so water vapor uh, is pulled off of the surface of water, condenses in the atmosphere, cools down, forms clouds, and then precipitation. Okay, water or snow, I'm sorry, rain or snow or whatever, however, water returns back. Okay, so that's part of the cycle. We also have to look at subsurface water flow, surface runoff, and stream flow. Okay, so we're really talking about where does it go once it has precipitated back down, and then how does it get back to where it needs to be to be evaporated again? Okay, so that's how sort of all three of these things work. Subsurface water flow is when you have water that, um, when you have precipitation, let's say a good heavy rain, and the water hits the ground and uh, it lands on the soil. Where does it go from there when it hits the soil? If it soaks in, what's it doing? Really like percolating. 
right? It's, it's going down in between those particles of soil into what becomes the groundwater. And if you dig deep enough, in most places, you will hit the water table. Hmm? Well, what did you say? Water Florida? Yeah, for sure. You can't dig very far, right? You will hit the water. A lot of Florida, I think it's below sea level. It's inland, right? So very, very close to the water table. Other places you can dig further before you hit water, but ultimately there's water underneath there. Um, so we're talking about subsurface water flow, water collecting in underground aquifers that are, that are collecting from uh, soil, basically water accumulation in the soil. And then you've got surface runoff, which is also a natural, naturally occurring process when water hits an impervious surface. So something that isn't a sponge. And if you think about the soil as a sponge, um, there are surfaces like rocks that don't absorb water. So when it rains like crazy and water is hitting, oh, I don't know, the granite dome of Stone Mountain, what is it doing? If it's not soaking into the granite, where is it going? It's going to run off, right? It's called surface runoff. It's not a trick. It's really that easy. So that's going to occur naturally. And then once you get uh, that water running off of something like a mountain, it's going to flow into small creeks, which are going to flow into little tributaries, which are going to get into larger streams and then ultimately rivers and make their way back to large lakes or the ocean, right? Which is where the cycle starts all over again. So we're just looking at the whole sort of total picture. One thing we should look at with runoff though, and those of you who are working on the lake stuff have probably thought about this. What when you start talking about uh, runoff that is unnatural, like it's not Stone Mountain, but it's a road or a parking lot or a neighborhood, what are we talking about problematically with water that runs off of, let's say, the college parking lot? Say again? Oil. Yeah, oils and pollutants, right? So chemicals that we produce that lay around on the surfaces are going to potentially make their way back into the water because they're running off of these impervious surfaces. We create lots of impervious surfaces. Roofs of buildings, parking lots, roads, bridges, right? House roofs, things like that. Um, so surface runoff becomes problematic when we make it so. Okay, so it's a normal part of the process, but when you start talking about polluted runoff, that's when it becomes an issue because it's all in getting into the water, which is cycling through. Okay, so if it's things that are potentially harmful, that can be problematic. All right, you guys comfortable with the water cycle? How it moves, where it goes, what all these terms mean. Pretty straightforward. Like I said, half of it you learn, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Are you okay? It's okay. Anyway, that's the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle. So that's the fancy scientific term for it. All right, let's look at carbon. Let me see. How, hold on one second. Let me see where we're going. Okay. Okay. I think we're going to finish this chapter. Okay, that's one of the reasons that I cut out uh, the nitrogen cycle and phosphorus cycle and all the other cycles. So if you're really interested in this stuff, it's in your textbook. But we're not going to go over anything but water and carbon. So let's talk about the carbon cycle, mainly because carbon is the number one on the list of elements that make up living things, but also because carbon is the number one element to talk about when we start moving into talking about climate change, which is going to be part of our last chapter. Okay. So um, that's what we'll do carbon. Carbon is present in all organic macromolecules. What are your organic macromolecules again? What am I talking about? The four big ones. Well, those are elements. I'm asking you for the big macromolecules, like the four classes of nutrients. Yes. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, Things like that. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about here. Basically, the building blocks of living things. They are your organic macromolecules, and they're all built around carbon. Because remember, carbon is really good at making bonds, and right? it has four electrons to share. So it just loves to make four bonds, and it makes it really stable to build these organic macromolecules. So that's why carbon is so important in living things. We can break the carbon cycle down. When we're talking about the cycle, remember we're talking about how it moves through things, through living things, non-living things, the atmosphere, et cetera. Break it down into two sub-cycles. You've got the biological carbon cycle, which is rapid. And then you've got the biogeochemical carbon cycle, which is long-term cycling. Okay, so those are the two, your two sub-cycles. Most of what we study up to this point 
when we talk about cellular respiration and we talk about digestion and we talk about photosynthesis, it's all going to be biological, right? Biogeochemical is talking about things like carbon reservoirs, things like oil in the in the or fossil fuels in the crust of the earth, right? How they got there, how we get them out, what that's doing long term. Okay. Bio, biological carbon cycle, um, moving carbon in terms of photosynthesis and respiration. So autotrophs need carbon, right? We just said they get it from where? Hmm? Yeah, carbon dioxide, right? They get it from the atmosphere and they produce oxygen. Byproduct of photosynthesis just happens to be O2, which works out great for aerobic organisms that are heterotrophic and need oxygen. They make what? CO2, yeah, so this. Yep, that's the biological carbon cycle. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, but the biogeochemical cycle, as I mentioned, is much longer. So we're looking at things like the atmosphere is a carbon reservoir. We've got carbon and carbon dioxide. Uh, water as well, carbon dioxide dissolved in water too. Ocean sediment. When something that is made of calcium carbonate falls to the floor of the ocean, You've got shells, right? Exoskeletons and, and shells of bivalves and things like that that are just sitting there, right? If they don't decompose before they get buried and pushed down into the ocean floor, they're going to become land sediments, part of the crust, limestone, okay? So we're looking at um, ocean sediment, land sediment, both of those things, those, that's all part of the biogeochemical cycle. The soil is a carbon reservoir. Um, and of course, fossil fuel. Okay, so we're going to talk about that again here in just a second. But this is again tracing atmosphere to ocean floor, like what I was just talking about with limestone. You do not have to tell me anything about the chemistry. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to um, regurgitate these equations or anything like that, but this is just to tell you a story. Atmospheric carbon dioxide and oceanic dissolved carbon are reciprocal, and one goes up, the other does too, right? So when you have atmospheric carbon dioxide dissolving into the ocean, they just do this, right? When there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, there's going to naturally be a rise in oceanic CO2 because they dissolve in and out of one another back and forth all the time. Dissolved carbon dioxide reacts with water, dissolves in the ocean to become carbonic acid, okay? That's why you hear about ocean acidification as a relation to climate change, because as you get more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you get more carbon dioxide in the ocean, and carbon dioxide dissolves into carbonic acid, and acid drops the pH, right? So that's why that um, ocean acidification comes in. Well, once you're in the ocean, you've got um, carbonic acid that is reciprocally moving in and out of its um, conjugate, so you get bicarbonate ions, okay? And bicarbonate ions dissociate into regular old carbonate ions, which are then picked up by animals who use it to make calcium carbonate exoskeletons or shells. Okay. Um, calcium is usually already present in the seawater, so that's where that comes from. CaCO3, that's your calcium carbonate. When they die, they sink to the floor. Over time, sediment in the ocean floor turns into limestone, which, as I just mentioned, is a major carbon reservoir. So that is one example of all the myriad, many myriad animals that contribute to this portion of the biogeochemical carbon cycle. So some of that limestone we dig up and use for stuff, and some of it hangs out in the ocean floor, and that is um, a carbon reservoir. Sometimes you see limestone formations where there used to be oceans, but now it's above water because of changes in uh, plate tectonics, right? So that's also part of the geological side of of the carbon cycle. All right, soil is a terrestrial carbon reservoir. Uh, stored carbon comes from decomposing organisms or weathering of rocks and minerals. We said when a living thing dies and decomposes in the soil, that carbon goes right back into the soil. Um, so that's one example. When we're talking about fossil fuels, we're talking about carbon that's deeper in the Earth's crust, those land sediment uh, reservoirs. You guys may remember when we talked about plants, we talked a little bit about fossil fuels and where they came from. Okay, we're talking about fossil fuels, we're talking about what? Give me some examples. Oil, shale, coal, right? Stuff like that. So 
These are, remember, anaerobically decomposed remains of plants that formed millions of years ago, over millions of years. Anybody remember? I don't know, I feel like I have to find some candy to give you if you can pull out for me the, the group of plants, the name of the group of plants that uh, rose fast, died quick, and gave rise to almost all the old deposits that we ended up with. Sorry? It's during the Carboniferous period, so I don't have any candy, but I just see if I did. Um, yeah, the Carboniferous is called the Carboniferous because those plants lived and died during that period of time. And they, when they did, there were so few, there were so few um, decomposers around that those tissues, those trees did not, did not decompose quickly. So they just laid there. Right? It's the lycopods, lycopodiaceae, and that rings a bell even, but it was in the video we watched ages ago. Um, same, same group as club moss. You guys remember out of sugar, there was a big, huge swath of those weird club moss and the flammable spore, same group. Anyway, um, so when we talked about the trees, they're getting their uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and then they're taking that carbon and they're fixing it, they're making it into organic compounds, and they're building tissues out of it. So, Organic tissues, as we just said a second ago, are rich in carbon. If they don't decompose and that carbon is not re released into the system, it's locked up in those tissues, which is what happened with those trees. Right? And so then over time, they got buried and they got compressed, and that carbon just sat there and decomposed anaerobically, never was released. You just get these rich carbon layers. What color is carbon? Do you guys know? Black, right? So when you see a layer, thick dark black layer of what we call coal that's essentially carbon rich remains of these trees super energy rich as well right why is that can you guys think through chemically why would coal be so rich in energy think about the carbon think about the bonds the chemical bonds that are holding together those organic molecules that the tree built in the first place when you build molecules, are you taking, are you using energy or are you releasing energy when you build molecules? You're using it. And then what happens to it? It's stored in those bonds. And if those bonds are never broken down through decomposition, they're still there. So those, those coal deposits and other fossil fuels are super high energy because those bonds are still intact. But so is the carbon, right? So when you dig it up and burn it, you are essentially releasing that energy, right? Because you're decomposing all of those bonds. You can harness that energy and you can do things with it like make electricity, right? Or fuel a vehicle. You're, you're using the energy that the sun put in the trees millions of years ago to drive your car down the street, right? Which is cool. But the problem is biogeochemical cycling takes millions of years. So what took millions of years to form, we have released a huge portion of it in 150 years, 200 years. So what's happening is not only is the energy being released from those bonds, but where's that carbon going? Going up into the atmosphere. And what happens to carbon when it combines with oxygen in the atmosphere? C plus O, CO2, right? So you get carbon dioxide as a byproduct of burning fossil fuels. So we were never intending to drastically increase the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but it's a side effect of using the energy that's in those bonds that we're now burning, we're breaking and we're burning fossil fuels. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's really the, the direction that we're heading. I got a little bit ahead of myself. I did want to introduce the term non-renewable resource, but I think you guys know what that means. What does a resource uh, that is not renewable, what does that mean? You can't. You can't renew it, right? You can't make more of it. In terms of fossil fuels, maybe you could, but it takes a really long time. Millions of years, billions of years, potentially, right? So it regenerates very slowly or not at all. So if we use it all, it's gone. Okay? And at the rate we're going, we're probably going to outpace the millions of years it takes to make fossil fuels. Um, aside from the fact that we're causing increased uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by using it. So that's another problem in and of itself, right? Is that it's finite. Um, yeah, so production, that's more of a geology thing. We're not really going to worry about that too much. Let's see. Okay, this is just more about the carbon cycle and sort of how you release, uh, release that carbon. 
So normally, without us, without anthropogenic fossil fuel burning, you do release that carbon eventually through things like volcanoes, right? Other geothermal events where you have vents that, that release CO2 from those um, from those stores underground, and that's a natural part of the biogeochemical slow carbon cycle. The problem is that we do it so much faster. So current data show that human emissions from burning fossil fuels produces between 100 and 300 times the amount that is emitted by volcanoes now. 300 times as much. That's significant, right? So that's what we're looking at here. So people say climate uh, change isn't really a thing, right? And that there are climate change deniers out there. But the problem is, we already talked about this. This is how the pool got there in the first place. There's that same video that we watched in the plant chapter. So you can go back and watch that again. It's just about the trees that gave rise to the coal deposits. Um, what I want to get to here is the cycle of graphs. And we haven't really looked at this. I don't think we've looked at this at all before. So it's helpful to, um, well, yeah, I think we did. Did we look at this? No, we looked at population graphs. That's what I'm thinking of. Okay, so this is atmospheric carbon dioxide and temperature. So I have a point about the climate change of deniers here. So here's temperature, and this is year before the present time. This is 400,000 years ago, same year. So this is the same time scale. You've got carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million and degrees in Celsius, okay? So what do you notice about these two data sets? Temperature, carbon dioxide. Do they appear to be related? Kind of reminds me of snowshoe here in the leaks, right? It's like obviously it's the same. you could take this one and lay it on top of this one, and they would be almost perfectly aligned. Why? Well, let me go backward one slide and then we'll come back to it. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Do you know what a greenhouse gas is? What is a greenhouse? What do you do in a greenhouse? You trap heat and moisture. You use it to grow plants and stuff, right? Because you can make sure that it stays warm and moist in there because glass lets sunlight in, it doesn't let it out. Okay, so it can it can penetrate the clear glass. And then when that uh, sunlight energy is absorbed in surfaces inside of the greenhouse, it dissipate, dissipates as heat. So remember, energy doesn't go anywhere, it just changes forms. So sunlight energy comes in, it can be absorbed, it can be reflected, but it doesn't get out of those glass panes. So that's why the temperature goes up inside of a greenhouse faster than it does outside. Um, outside, same thing in your car, right? How long does it take before it gets unbearably hot inside of your car in summer when your windows roll down? In Georgia, like 30 seconds, right? The sunlight's coming through your windows, it's absorbing into your car seats, right? And into your other upholstery or your dashboard or whatever, and it's coming off as heat and it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter in there. Greenhouse effect, okay? But carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And gases that are considered greenhouse gases act just like those panes of glass, trapping heat and moisture inside, okay? It's insulation, so it's necessary. It is critical, in fact, to life on the planet that we have some greenhouse gases. They act like a blanket. They make it warm enough on the planet to sustain life. Right? If we don't have any insulation in the atmosphere, it's too cold to live. Okay? So we need them. It's normal for them to be there. Um, it's not just carbon dioxide, it's other things like methane, nitrous oxide counts. Uh, water vapor is a, is a greenhouse gas. So you need moisture in the air to hold in warmth. Okay? So they're all supposed to be there. The problem is when you exceed expectations of natural carbon so uh, cycling of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. When you trap heat above and beyond what you should be, so if you have too much greenhouse gas, you have it's like putting on three blankets in the summer. You just need a sheet, but you've got three quilts. You see what I'm saying? So you're insulating the planet too much, and the overall temperature rises. When you look at what we cook, the reason, okay, let me, there are several important things I want to say here. Weather and climate are different. Okay, when we start talking about global warming versus climate change, it's better to use the term climate change because when you say global warming, people say things like, well, it's not that warm where I live, right? Or we just had a blizzard. How are you going to tell me that it's getting warmer? You guys heard things like that before? 
like every time it snows, somebody posts on social media, so much for global warming. I don't know if you guys see that or not, but I've definitely seen it before. Um, the problem is it's not necessarily only warming, right? So weather is short-term atmospheric conditions. We don't call it weather change. We call it climate change, right? So weather patterns fluctuate. Predictions can made, be made about four days in advance, 24, 48, 72 hours. We do a 10 day forecast. How often is it right 10 days from now? Not very often, right? Because it's just a model and it's just a guess. The point here is that weather is short term patterns like rainfall, temperature, things like that. Climate is long term. Okay. That means over long periods of time. You can take averages, you can look at um, rainfall totals, annual temperature fluctuations, things like that. And what we see when we look at these longer term uh, conditions is things like maybe the upper limit of temperature doesn't always go uh, up as quickly, but the lower end of the average range doesn't drop as much. So you see subtle changes in the overall data when you look at climate versus weather. That makes sense. So it's staying warmer, it doesn't get as cold as frequently, but it's not necessarily getting to be 140 degrees outside. So it may not be the noticeable type things to you and I, but it's this gradual uh, changes in these long-term patterns that are changing things like growing season length or melting polar ice caps, right? Things like that long-term type of things. So weather and climate are different, that's important. Global warming doesn't really tell the whole picture, doesn't really tell the whole story. So we like to say climate change rather. When you have changes in climate, you see changes in weather, things like more violent storms, more hurricanes, more tornadoes, uh, worse drought seasons, all of these sort of crazy fluctuation forest fires, right? Wildfires um, can all be tied back to those changes in climate. Um, so climate affects weather, but climate and weather are different. Is that clear? Okay. The other important thing that I want to talk about again is back to these cycles. Because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and it traps heat in the atmosphere, when you have higher concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, temperature does what? It rises, right? It goes up, it increases. When you have lower levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, what happens to the temperature? It decreases. It's all about that insulation. So if we're looking back 400,000 years ago, where did we get this data? Were there people even here 400,000 years ago? There we're not, right? So we're looking at like ice cores and sediment cores and things like that to look at this stuff um, and figure that out. But what you can see is that fluctuations are normal, up and down. We know that, and okay? that's that is supposed to happen. The problem is when you get above the levels of what you would expect normally through just geochemical, biogeochemical cycling, and that's what you see here. So here's the same graph, but transcribed over here and including present day. So these fluctuations down here are the same ones that are here until you get right here and then boom, what happens? Well, this is carbon dioxide concentration. This is the historical highs and this is now. This bit here is the anthropogenic piece. You guys see what I'm saying? What do I mean? What does anthropogenic mean? Man-made, yep. So we would expect this these fluctuations in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this is above, well above and beyond what you would expect based on historical highs, okay? This is largely fossil fuel carbon dioxide release, okay? Because it happened so quickly since the industrial revolution. Um, and then basically what happens here is you take this little piece of the graph and you take it this is zero present day, here's 1955. So you're just taking this piece of the graph and you're stretching it out. I need to change your scale here. So you can just see since the 50s even, just climbing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere because of technology, industry, growing population, increased vehicle use by airplanes and like that. Okay. So it's not that global warming makes the planet hot. It's not that climate change doesn't occur in the absence of people. It's the important, the important thing is being able to look at the data and tease out what is what. What is our, uh, what is on us versus not. 
right? And what does it mean weather and climate wise? So this is just a, a little sort of a cartoon that is a visual of how global warming works. So you've got the earth, you've got our atmosphere, and here's the energy coming in from the sun. Sunlight energy should enter and reflect back off. What's it hitting here? Like this white piece, do you think? Ice caps, right? So a lot of sunlight energy comes in and is reflected back to space from these polar ice caps. Some of it will be absorbed, used for photosynthesis, changed into heat, and then released, right? That's normal. What happens when you have too much insulation is that those heat rays bounce around a little bit longer before they get out, which heats the earth just like the interior of your car. No dogs were harmed in the making of this PowerPoint. This is a quick reminder to you. But don't leave your dog in the car or your friends or your children or children you babysit. Okay? All right, that's the end of the chapter. We did it. Turn to our 12 10. We're good. So, next, uh, next class on Wednesday, we'll do chapter 47, which is even shorter than this one. So, we'll definitely get all the way through it. We'll talk more about climate change and why it matters in biology. Okay, so we'll talk about changes in migration patterns and uh, what happens to different species. What are some of the um, direct impacts of climate change? Because we always talk about it, right? Like, this is terrible. What are we going to do? But it's sort of interesting to talk about individual reasons why it matters. Like, why do you care? Why can't we just let it get warmer? Like, it's a big deal, right? So we'll talk more about that in the last chapter. We'll talk about extinction events, which will be kind of interesting because we haven't really talked about that too much. Um, and just a little bit about conservation, and that'll be at Third Ecology. And then we'll do uh, a Kahoot together. Remember, I promised you that we want about May and that ecology. So we'll do some practice questions like the ones you guys will see on the final um, about determining whether it's population or community or ecosystem levels questions. And then you guys will be giving me justification as to why. So remember, that'll be the only questions you've ever seen in this whole class that are not multiple choice. Okay, you'll have to give me short answers on those questions. So we'll practice that on Wednesday, and that is it.